Mango Tango Music. I'm Abby and with you today I have Izzy, Tiff, Jay and Mel and we're lucky to have the absolute legend, like don't even know where to begin, <laughs> he is the Santa in his spare time. Um, we're lucky to have Jason Morrison from Reverse K Touring. So Jason, <laughs> if you could just like let us know all of the stuff you do and like yeah, tell us about Santa as well <laughs> towards the end because I reckon that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's um, it doesn't seem like a lot to me because I'm wearing different hats on different days. But when you put it like that, it it's uh, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I've been uh, working in music for the best part of ten to twelve, 30, something like that years over ten years. Um, starting off as a musician myself solo acoustic artist uh and that then led into booking my own gigs and booking my own tours and um living in regional victoria at the time working with other young and developing bands in various ways which led to um going taking them to shows and um work on that side of things which led into touring which is kind of where i found my um my passion my niche is in tour managing and um tour promoting, event managing, those sort of things. Uh, I'm a Santa Claus at a shopping centre um, when it comes to Christmas season. So um, they're three of the most noticeable hats that I wear and then um, other smaller ones along the way. But yeah, that's kind of my, uh, me in a, in a sentence. What has been the highlight of your many careers that you've had throughout the years? <laughs> things like the general highlights of when you're running a show you're running a tour and it is going well and you see the people who are in the front row who are the most dedicated fans have been lining up for an hour before doors who have already bought all the merch who know every word who are crying and i'm kind of standing side stage just you know monitoring the situation making sure all the parts are moving and you're just watching them having the time of their lives for whatever act whatever event give you the warm and fuzzy that means a lot that's the you know at the end of the day i don't need the band to get up on stage and and say, oh, thanks to Jason for doing this, that, and the other. Like, that's, I don't care about that. I'm happy to be behind the scenes and happy to, you know, make sure that everything's oiled and, and moving smoothly. But you see that, you see them thanking the band and knowing that you are able to provide the best, safest, mentally the best as well. So the band's in the best state to hang out with their fans and want to be able to just engage if that's the option. Or that, That's just an ongoing highlight of... Um, of work in it. Lead, lead straight into our next question. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody would think that I've done this before or have regular what? conversations with people. <laughs> so, uh, um, what are some of those uh, probably more specific things that you do find challenging um, in, in, yeah, in, in touring and that kind of stuff? Finding the work itself, particularly when I was starting, particularly thinking I could do yeah, I'm a tour manager. I can, I've done a couple of tours, but then realizing there's so much more, even now after being in it for a fair while, to go to the next level, there's still so much more that I can learn it and get better at. I most A lot of the tours I've done over the last few years range between yeah, 200 to 2,000 size venues. So knowing that, that 5,000, 10,000, like those next bigger venues, I've still got stuff to learn. But me as like, you know, an early, a green uh, music industry self-employed person was like yeah i can do all of this and but finding the work finding the people who um would give you the chance would give you the opportunity and also then selling yourself short like doing a job for much less because you just wanted to get on the road or you wanted to actually get it to learn to get along with like lots of different personalities yeah i can imagine that that would be a challenge on some days as well i think i can one of the biggest bits of advice I can offer anybody, you guys, and also if anyone else watches is manage people's expectations because that is so important in an industry that has so much, such big highs and such big lows that if people know where they're going to fall roughly, they can then be mentally prepared. Um, so what, is the kind of things that you are still learning and what elements kind of go into making a tour? So basically there's a couple of different ways a tour can happen. Um, if we're talking about a local band level, so where they might sell um, 50 to 60 tickets at the workers club, that's about a 200 cap venue. Um, and they want to, you know, they're releasing an EP and they want to go to each city. 
and they're doing it all themselves. Maybe they've got a booking agent or a manager, just one extra person. They will then reach out to the venue, say, hey, you want to do this? Then you'll go back and forth with the booking agent of the venue, booking agent of the band or manager, and you'll negotiate costs, all of these things. Now, as you go further up, there's more moving parts. Band booking agent, the venue booking agent, management, and everyone's got to work out what's the routing that fits. Once you get that, if you're looking at a, say someone I work with, for example, who might be doing the corner hotel, pretty common, like medium tier tour, the band's management or the promoter will get in contact with me to say, we want you to tour manage this tour. Here's the dates. Here's the contact details of the band's, um, the best person to speak to in the band in regards to tech stuff. Maybe they've got their own guitar tech or, or something along those, those lines. Here's all the venues and here's all the, here's the budget. Here's the key information. And then from there, it's my job as tour manager to then collate all that information, collate all the information from the venue, put that together in nice spreadsheets, which is my, my love, and then book accommodations, book flights, book um, ground transport, book backline or arrange backline and put all these parts into a nice spreadsheet and then into a tour book or an app called Master Tour, which is pretty common that basically you have on your phone and you can use as a Bible for your tour. You then execute it. You then arrange where you're going to meet the band, get the band to the shows. At the end, brief the venue, brief the guards, um, arrange the sound check times, all of this sort of stuff. Then settle with the venue at the end of the night, get the money or get the paperwork signed so that everyone knows. Australia is pretty good like that because a lot of the time it's run through Oztix or these other ticketing agencies. Mm. So you've done some promotion work too. So what goes into like good promotion for like a tour? Again, it comes back to managing expectations is a really early one. Uh, if you reach out to a band's uh, booking agent uh, and you look at what they're doing in America, they may, might be doing 500 tickets a night in America. Uh, and you kind of go, okay, well, your first time here, you're probably not going to get 500 a night here is what their American average is. So that's the first thing you've got to manage is when you reach out, you say, look, from the people who I know, the people who I've spoken to, done some ground research. And then from that point is when you book the shows, you lock it in, you negotiate the dates, you negotiate how it fits. So again, it, it really, it really, it's like a Venn diagram and it for tour for promoting and then tour managing. And it kind of crosses over at that point. Um, and you can then take some of that stuff and, and, transfer it over and whether you're, you're the promoter but you're a promoting australian band it's the same same mechanics are there any real major differences between doing a tour for international bands versus local bands start talking about the differences in australian and u.s touring is i think the two that come to mind is payment and terminology first thing yeah terminology if you're not across that um and again in terms of payment for example, uh, we use the example of Oztix. Oztix will pay you two business days after the tour, after the show, as long as all the paperwork's submitted. So it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good system. They hold all the money there. They make their interest. That's how they keep their business going. It also means that I can't withdraw the money and then potentially risk if the show gets cancelled at the last minute, I have the money and the pay, patrons can't get their funds back or if there's an issue with it, you know, it just holds it there. So then at the end it's released or each, they might have a promoter for three shows and then the next three shows might have different people will often get paid at the end of the night in cash, what they've been given minus expenses. So I've had bands get to the end of the night and be like, where's our money? I'm like, it doesn't work that way here. So very early on, I learned that those are the sort of expectations to manage and say, Hey, just so you know, you won't get paid at the end of the night. If you're using a merch company, you won't get paid at the end of the night. You'll get paid at the end of the tour when they take out their expenses and they'll transfer you one lump sum. There are some of the big things between Australian tours and uh, bands coming over. It's just those things that might be so subtly you might, you might miss. Um, and it wasn't until I went and did tours of the States that I really realised some of those differences, some of the language, you know. Um, the, fact that, the fact that in America, a 15-seater Ford, van the standard tour van the seats are flat so you can actually lie down and get a half decent sleep whereas a toyota high ace vans here are slightly bucketed and they're not comfortable to lie on they're not comfortable to sleep in How did those, those bands sorry jay um it just sorry, yeah. made me think like obviously you're working with bands overseas and like all of that how do these bands like find you to be the tour manager like do you 
know that say somebody's about to start touring and you get in contact and have a bit of a chat or the times that I've gone overseas with bands has been with Australian bands. Um, so at the moment I haven't worked with an international band overseas. I've had a couple of like little nibbles, but nothing that's been able to eventuate. Um, so it's really, it's partially word of mouth, partially um, word of mouth between bands, word of mouth between managers and agents. I've had work from booking agents who are like, Hey, we just lost our tour manager for this tour. Can you come on and cover? And then I've ended up working with that person for you know a couple of years after that. I don't want to say right place, right time, because you try and put yourself in the best place. But there's been stuff I've turned down because I had something else on the go. So the management, band, promoter, agent trusts you and like you. Like if you're one of the boys, or if you're one of the girls, or if you're one of the like, if you're mates, that strengthens your resume 100% because people want to know that they're going to get along with who they work with. Pre-COVID, I have a pretty big gap in my schedule, like um, May onwards. I'm just going to start cold calling anyone who I knew was a manager. But again, you send out 100 emails, you might get one hint that might be able to help pay the rent for another month, which at the end of the day is kind of all we're really here for, isn't it? Like just to keep, keep the, the roof on our heads so we can keep doing what we love. Um, it's really just showing that you're trustworthy, reliable, and um, people want to hire you and eventually if you stick at it and you prove that you can do the job and be a good person and a person that people want to hang out with um you know hopefully good things come your way but the flip side of it is don't let it get you down the fact that you're not there yet uh, you said that when things go back they're not going to be the same so uh how do you foresee things not being the same what differences do you see will happen changes that are happening now will last for a while now, some people might not have a big problem with it. Some people might. So I think the festivals and those big events will restructure somehow to factor in, the, you know, whether they scale back their ticket sizes and rebuild it up again over time. I think that's a big one. I think that we'll probably see bigger bands doing more shows at smaller venues. Do you see bands from like Australian bands that are living in the US and the UK and stuff coming back to Australia to play? Hmm. It's tough because there are people who want to come back because it's safer here. Um, you know, what we have like 500 active cases today. Uh, and the guy I was talking to on a podcast earlier, Santa, he had Southern California, thousand deaths today. So it's safer here. So that will bring some people back. Um, but on the other hand, because our restrictions are so much tighter, the band's still may be able to tour in some form of another. There's bands doing drive-in shows. There are bands doing outdoor shows there are bands doing um lower capacity shows with these and there are bands who just don't give a shit and just playing normal shows um you've touched on this already but do you have any advice for students that are wanting to get into tour management into tour management specifically uh the two points i know i raised about managing expectations is important for yourself for others T touring is keeping eggs in the air a dozen eggs and you've got to decide which ones you're going to drop so um, letting people know, yeah, you will drop eggs, but you've got to keep the ones that make the most money the highest. Obviously looking at people further on than you uh, to try and just see the subtle things that they do or the really great things that you may not get in the textbook or you may not, you might have to just learn by practical side of things. They're two big things. As a tour manager, you need to know about the whole operation. So the more you know about how the gear works, how to set up a drum kit, how to set up a guitar and how, and the different guitar. You don't need to know how each guitar head operates and what the tone differences are between them. You just need to know that a Marshall 1960A flat cab, flat facing cab is different to a 1960B, which is a slander cab and people want different ones because it does different things. Knowing how a venue operates. So even if that means going and getting a cash job as a busy. Uh, or working in a bar, just a venue, so you can kind of see how the back end of a venue operates. Because if you know how they work, you know what they expect from you and what you expect from them. Yeah, I don't know. Put your hand up for stuff. I think if there's something that comes up, you might fail at it. You might hate it. But, you know, it's the music industry. Like, no one's going to judge you if you, you know, don't like something. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, again, it's been so insightful kind of talking to you. I can't even begin to describe how much we've taken away from this.
Um, <laughs> you're just such a cool, cool guy. Um, I mean, hearing that you were Santa automatically made me think that you were cool. <laughs> Chatting to you and learning about how like passionate you are about things and how much knowledge you have and you know your willingness to kind of share that with us um, is definitely something really special. So thank you for popping on the interview. Um, it's yeah. a pleasure. Thank you.